The time has finally come for a showdown of sorts. I am now, what, four years or so into what are the words that I always use, my epic, profound, earth-shattering change that happened in my life that fateful night of September 12th, 2020, that light on that particular part of my porch shining down on that particular couch, that amazing synchronicity where I found God and the four years of amazing synchronicities that followed something equally as impactful, but in a different way, happened recently. And the time has come to bite the hand that fed me. The time has come to shoot holes in the very phenomenon that delivered me unto God. The phenomenon that saved me. The time has come, as much as I thought synchronicity to be magical, to remove it from its pedestal and rip it to shreds. To break its back like it broke mine split it open and rip out chunks and pieces like it did me in the painful pursuit of truth. Is there any modicum of it in synchronicity or is synchronicity merely just a cheap parlor trick at best, just pure coincidence or at worst, the cruel pranks of a devious and or vengeful God? Well, because it now seems that my whole life hinges on that question, in case you haven't been following, I completely threw my old life of 37 years in the garbage because of this question. And so, you had better believe that we are going to get our answer today. This episode is going to be brutal, and it is going to be long, and it's going to be intense. Such extremities are unavoidable when you're tackling such a weighty topic as truth itself. Blood will be shed. So prepare yourself. You will have to challenge long-held and cherished convention within yourself and society as a whole. The only way to make it to the other side on this one is to shed your skin, to forget everything you thought you knew about truth, which is akin to forgetting everything you thought you knew about knowing at all. Let go of this world. Detach yourself and follow me as we seek the source of truth itself. If you have been following my channel, specifically in the past few months, you know that me and my wife recently underwent the terrible tragedy that is a miscarriage. Granted, it could have been a lot worse. The pregnancy could have been a lot further along. Heck, uh, it, the, the pregnancy could have been so far along that we gave birth, actually, and had a child, and the child grew up and then died. I don't know where you put the ceiling on the tragedy here in terms of how old a child is when they finally die. I mean, if it's five years old and then dies, that's devastating. If they're 15 years old and then dies, th that's devastating in a whole other way. If they're 35 years old and then dies, y'all, you can just imagine, okay? I actually, in some capacity, count myself as lucky that that didn't happen, but y'all, Dead is dead. I hate to be so brutal up front here and so in your face about this. And anyone of my family or friends, specifically my wife who may hear this, just know that I am not taking this lightly. The wake of this devastation, y'all, led me almost to suicide. 
there's a buzzword for the freaking algorithms out there and YouTube and podcasts or whatever that will knock me down a few pegs, but I don't care because y'all appreciate my raw emotion, and I'm telling you right now, this is about as raw as it gets. I don't care how old the child was, we lost a child. And it had extra significance for me because of the story behind all of this. How we arrived at this miscarriage is cosmically significant to me, considering that I was a nihilist and an atheist for 27 years of my life. So deep into nihilism, y'all, where I viewed all life, but especially my own, as a curse, a plague. I didn't want to have children because I hated myself so much. I didn't want something that resembled me in any capacity to draw breath. I knew what I was, and I was a piece of shit. And I didn't want to bring another piece of shit mouth to feed on this planet to consume and wreck other people's lives like I did. And sure, I didn't believe in God, but you better believe that I believed in evil. And in my opinion, the best way to stop evil is to choke it off at the source. And so, yeah, that combined again with the fact that I looked at all life as a virus, just consuming and not producing a waste of matter that is no different than the pile of dirt that it stands upon. In fact, the pile of dirt is more noble than the human being on top of it because a pile of dirt is not capable of evil. A pile of dirt doesn't understand that other sentient beings suffer and feel and then use that knowledge to torture. There, I just proved that a pile of dirt is better than a person. Are you happy? No? Good. Welcome to 27 years of my life before I found God. And then, upon finding God, understanding that there is so much more beyond my understanding that I could possibly imagine, and having my mind open up to the concept of redemption and love and forgiveness and how, despite all of the terrible things and how much of a piece of shit I thought I was, I am worthy of that redemption, love, and forgiveness, and how everyone on the planet is worthy too, and how that unites us all in this unbelievably beautiful common bond. And through understanding that, I start to love myself more and to appreciate the actual beauty of life and get so pumped up about it that now I want to bring a life form onto this planet that's just like me. I can't wait to teach this child about love and beauty and redemption and forgiveness and all this stuff that we need to do for each other and ourselves. Love your neighbor, love your enemy, love yourself, love God, love, love, love. And life is the ultimate expression of that love. And I just couldn't wait to have it. And I'm walking into this glorious understanding hand in hand with God, step by step with God showing me how to heal myself along the way, only to have him turn around and fashion everything I had learned from him into a dagger which he then plunges into the recesses of my heart, bleeding me dry at his feet. I had come so far. I was so excited, excited about life, fighting for life. And then life itself is wielded against me. The poetry there, albeit Sophoclean, was not lost on me one iota. It was like, Saving a bus full of kindergarten children from falling off of a cliff and the children are so happy and jumping with joy and screaming with glee and you are too and you think you're driving them to safety and you turn the corner and you realize that you accidentally drove them right into a forest fire and inferno and now you have to watch all of those children that you just saved mere seconds from jumping with glee and screaming with joy, and now they're screaming an entirely different kind of scream as you watch them burn to death in front of your face. And you survive, actually, and you have to live with that for the rest of your life. That's what it felt like. But it was even worse than that, 
because God was showing me through signs and wonders and synchronicities that a literal miracle was going to happen. We were going to get a heartbeat, y'all, on this ultrasound, which turned into two ultrasounds. And each time a new ultrasound came about and failed to produce a heartbeat, I would get a doubling down on these signs, either new signs or signs telling me that I need to trust the signs. And then, of course, trip 15 happens on the second ultrasound that where we, we, you know, we don't get a heartbeat and I want to go to the source and figure out what's the deal. You told me to trust the signs. And on that experience, y'all, I talk face to face with something, some kind of ethereal, otherworldly, large and terrifying and beautiful entity. It looks me in the face and tells me that a miracle will happen if we go with a third ultrasound. It goes on to say, trust the signs. And sometimes something that seems dead can be very much alive. And we all know what happens next, don't we? Fast forward a week. And I am crying my eyeballs out on YouTube, renouncing God, taking down my channel, and realizing that I had completely wasted three and a half years of my life on fairy tale bullshit. All because of the false promises of synchronicity. And so, why waste my breath? Why say another freaking word about it? Well, as you can see, just by looking at how much time we have left in this episode... There's obviously something still worth talking about here, and in spite of the absolute gut punch that I received, when I look back on some of the most impactful synchronicities I've experienced over these years, combined specifically with the absolutely amazing ones that I had in the days following the miscarriage, I am not willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater quite yet, and I'm sure you will understand why when I get into it. There is very important analysis yet to be done. We need to figure out if synchronicities are legit or not. If they're not legit, we can just all kind of laugh at them and move on. But if they are legit, the serious ones, because there is quite a variety of them, and you'll find that out later. If the serious ones are legit, y'all, we're talking about God and salvation here. Again, the stakes could not be any higher. And so... We're going to start our analysis by diving into two different synchronicities that I experienced about a year ago. One that is utterly ridiculous and silly and has no bearing on anything even remotely profound, yet it is still amazing. And then the other one we will examine, in my humble opinion, is nothing short of looking God directly in the face. I want you to listen, and I want you to think to yourself, how you would react if you were the one experiencing these synchronicities. And I'll even help you by giving this the full treatment with the whole music and sound effects and the whole nine yards. And so let's get started with that silly one first. I'll even drop in some goofy music here. Okay, maybe not that goofy. Let's try something else. Maybe more like this. Okay, there we go. All right, so... The date is April 17th, 2023. I had just gotten off the phone with a friend of mine who is into spiritual stuff just like I am. We talked a lot about astral projection. We nerded out about the gateway tapes. Here is the next step along your path to the gateway of discovery. He told me about these other programs, these other sets of tapes with the Monroe Institute and sent me a set of these tapes via Google Drive. Okay, these aren't real tapes anymore. They are MP3 files. But anyway, curious as I am, I put on my headphones, opened up the first file, the introduction. The old story has it that as we go through life, we really don't change. And just started listening. We just become more of the same. And it's basically just Robert Monroe rehashing his astral projection origin story. Back in 1958, it was called Astral Projection. Which I am now very familiar with, having read two of his three books. We call it the out-of-body state. And so I zone out a little. My mind starts to drift. The label felt uncomfortable. And I do what I usually do when my mind starts drifting, and I start thumbing my way through my YouTube feed on my phone. You know, just kind of halfway listening to good old Bob Monroe rattle on, while adding videos to my Watch Later YouTube playlist. Hmm, that one looks cool. But anyway, I'm thumbing and I'm thumbing, 
Bob's back there going off on God knows what. This separateness can be two inches or 2,000 miles. But he starts talking about odd phrases that people use to describe out-of-body experiences. Human history is full of such references to what we call out-of-body. Stuff like beside yourself and out, out of, of your, your mind, mind or fall asleep and wake up, pass, pass out. out, and it goes on and on. Nothing really surprising there. But then he throws out something completely out of left field. Something that, in my opinion, didn't quite fit in with what he was saying. And that's when it happened. Okay, so I'm pausing this now to tell you that if you're listening to this on YouTube, this is when you need to actually look at your screen because I'm going to play a reenactment of exactly how this amazing synchronicity went down. And no, I wasn't recording my screen in the moment. I'm not, you know, constantly recording my screen. But I was so blown away immediately after this happened that I had to recreate it, you know, knowing that I was going to use it in a future episode. So I opened up my screen recording app and, you know, went back to YouTube and thumbed my way back and hit record. And so what you're about to see is maybe 30 seconds or so after it happened, but this is exactly how it went down. And yes, I'm using overly dramatic music as a joke here. I'm really going for that 300 kind of vibe, you know, this is Sparta. But anyways, back to the story. And so I'm thumbing and I'm thumbing. Bob Monroe is back there flapping his gums again. Fall asleep and wake up, pass out. And here it is. And it goes on and on. Even to witches who rode a broomstick. Myth or misconception. Did you see that? If not, I'll play it again. This is exactly what I saw in the moment. Human history is full of such references to what we call out of body. You're beside yourself, out of your mind. Fall asleep and wake up, pass out. And it goes on and on even to witches who rode a broomstick. I hope you can appreciate what just happened there, okay? That is exactly what I saw in the moment. And for those of you who cannot see what we're talking about right here, right when Robert Monroe says, Witches Who Wrote a Broomstick, I thumbed my way past an ad for the musical Wicked right in that moment. And almost in a slapstick fashion, boom, there is a witch basically yelling at you, uh, shaking her broomstick at you uh, in that moment. Quite freaking amazing, in my opinion. Amazing, but also undeniably goofy. I mean, it's kind of taking everything in me not to uh, burst into laughter, <laughs> not only uh, about the actual synchronicity, but my uh, over-dramatization of it. Okay, that was all a big joke for a reason. Uh, there's still a lot of deep insight here uh, to kind of unearth and unpack here, but we're going to save the commentary for after both of these synchronistic examples. Okay, that was the goofy one. That was the one that I intended all of us to kind of look and point at and laugh and snicker and say, ha, 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 this synchronicity stuff is absolutely ridiculous. It's bunk. It needs to be thrown in the garbage. But now, y'all, we move on to the serious one, okay? And I hope you've gotten all of that goofiness out of your system because from here on out, y'all, it is about as serious as you can possibly imagine. When you hear what happens on this next synchronicity, providing that you think there's even a shred of truth whatsoever in synchronicity, and it's not just complete random coincidental chaos, if there is even the tiniest element of truth in synchronicity, y'all, this next one is about as cosmic and as serious as you could ever imagine. Okay, playtime is over. This is how that one went down. Whoa, that last song was awesome. Good one, good one. So what you are hearing yes. right now yes. is the aftermath of one of the most beautiful things that I have ever bore witness to in my entire life. Even though I did not capture the actual moment as it happened, always the journalist, of course, I took out my phone immediately after to document what I could. It's the night of February 11th, 2023, and my wife and I are two of a group of about a dozen or so friends who took a weekend trip to Galveston, Texas for Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras 2023! Yeah, woo! 
The first night we were there, we're all sitting around a fire, drinking and listening to music. My wife is sitting on my knee. My friend Joe is dancing like an idiot to the left of me. And everyone else is either dancing also, or watching my friend Joe dance, or talking amongst themselves. A very popular 80s song that everyone loves comes on the Bluetooth speaker. And all at once, everyone either starts dancing or singing or both. Except me, because even though I know of the song and recognize it, I don't know the lyrics. And so the energy is building and building. Everyone's having a grand old time. My friend Joe is dancing even more like an idiot. My wife is now dancing on my knee. Everyone else is dancing and singing. The vibe is swelling. Someone in the group throws out a quick one-liner that causes half of the group to erupt in uproarious laughter. <laughs> and there was this moment. It only lasted for three or four seconds, but it felt like an eternity and is forever burned into my mind, where every single person in the group, even the quiet ones, were either laughing hysterically, dancing uncontrollably, or singing at the top of their lungs. <laughs> Every single person was beaming with glee, radiating pure, unbridled joy. And seeing this and taking it all in and being overwhelmed in the moment, I had a thought. I wonder if this is what heaven is like. And immediately after thinking that, my friend Joe stops dancing like an idiot. My wife stops bouncing on my knee. Everything goes still. And there's this moment where my friend Joe and my wife turn their heads towards mine. And then they both, unplanned and unprompted, stick their faces in my face and together in unison, sing the last three words of the song, just like heaven by the cure just like heaven just like heaven it's the only time those words are mentioned in the song and my friend and my wife sang those very words to me inches from my face looking me directly in the eye right after i had that very thought and it's one of those things, now that I've had enough of these experiences, I've learned how to play it off in a public setting, act normal, fight back tears, pretend that God did not just open up the gates of heaven and let you peek in for three seconds. And so in the moment, I made a comment about the song being awesome. That last song was awesome. I pretended like I needed to go use the restroom. No, I'm going to use the restroom real quick. And I stole myself away upstairs to document what I remembered. I just had one of the most happiest moments of my entire life. It was in a moment. And, I don't know, I was... can't finish that sentence. I had one of the most beautiful moments that I've, that I've ever had in my entire life down there, or just now. It was so beautiful, y'all. It was so beautiful, you have no idea how beautiful it was. Listen to them. You're hearing God this Zen moment of a triangulation of 
I sat there, y'all, I am not joking around when I say this, I sat there, my beautiful wife sitting in my lap, everybody's laughing, people were in an uproarious symphony of laughter, and people were dancing. And I looked at my beautiful wife having such a great time. And I looked at everyone. And I had this moment where I felt like, is this what heaven is like? And right when I right when I had that thought, one of my best friends, the guy, y'all, who married, the guy that married me and my wife, that we read our vows, If you're wondering why the video abruptly cut off there, it's because I dropped the phone and began sobbing uncontrollably. My wife eventually came in, you know, worried that I had been away from the group for so long. She barged into the room and saw me on the floor, and I just held her there in my arms, continuing to sob, repeating the words, I just saw heaven. I just saw heaven. If you were able to picture that in your mind's eye and feel the emotion of the scene that I just laid out to you, you have the tiniest of tiny of tiniest of tiny ideas of what is in store for us. An eternity of that dialed in such that it never gets old because it is the source of joy itself. That is, of course, if you believe anything that you just heard. And not on my part. Hopefully, by now, if you're a loyal follower, you'll know that I tell you exactly what happens and how it happens. Okay, I don't make things up. It's not me who's in question here. What's in question is is the whole question of synchronicity. As earth-shattering as that little slice of heaven synchronicity was, it's still within the same vein as the witch on a broom and the rubber-meets-the-road failed moment of my baby daughter and the miscarriage and the heartbeat, all that stuff. Any of the amazing synchronicities that I've had, y'all. I mean, I've had some goofy ones, but... These amazing ones, y'all. I mean, that volley of knock-on-the-door synchronicities and all of my amazing ones with Jesus and, you know, horse training and Maverick and all that stuff, y'all. And then there's these absolutely cherished ones with my friend who passed away and those things that he said actually being real in real life and the exact same thing happening with my uncle who had passed away. I saw him on a trip and then he basically plays a practical joke on me in real life. And that amazing story about borrowing a jacket or whatever happened in real life. Someone asked me to borrow my jacket that same day. And I could go on and on here. There's that amazing one where my wife was cheering me up and I recognized the humor of being exactly like God's humor. The time I was on ayahuasca and had that breakthrough. And I thought to myself in the moment, this is God's humor. You are God right now. And my wife stops, looks at me and says, you're God right now. That's what you're thinking, right? And then there's that synchronicity, y'all, where two people freaking died on mile marker 666. And then there's the whole crucifix thing. And then that wife's husband, his name is Andrew, and they say the, the word infinity. And then there's that horse that gets injured, and its name is Faith, and all that stuff. And it's all related to the same story. It's like, what in the world, y'all? What in the freaking world? And then you get a heart with the name Julia in the middle of that heart. Synchronicity after synchronicity about babies and birth and all this other stuff. You have a psychedelic experience where the Archangel Gabriel looks you in the face and says, 
Sometimes something that seems dead can be very much alive. Trust the signs. A miracle will happen. And the day comes where that miracle is supposed to happen. And it doesn't happen. In fact, the opposite happens. Suddenly, the rationalist explanation for synchronicity, for the psychedelic experience, for any mystical experience, for God himself... Suddenly, this rationalist explanation seems a little more palatable, seems a little bit more like reality, seems a little bit more like the truth. It's all coincidence. It's all the power of suggestion. It's all a giant Rorschach inkblot test on which you project your hopes and fears and wishes. It is confirmation bias. It is cognitive dissonance. It is Occam's razor. There is no God. God is an illusion, and all he really is is an elaborate survival mechanism. In fact, the survival mechanism of last resort, and one so convincing that our brains bend our perception around it. Everything is God if you think God is everything. It's kind of like having a cutout filter on a camera. Whatever shape that you cut into a filter and place over your lens, your pictures will be that shape. Like like any light source that is in that photograph that you take, whatever photograph, it'll be the shape of the filter that you place on top of the lens. And I'm showing an example of that right now uh, on YouTube if you're watching this. This dude it has a Christmas tree shaped filter, and when he slaps it on his lens and takes a picture or a video, lo and behold, all of the bokeh, like all of the light sources, look like Christmas trees. And he does the same thing with hearts and stars. Now, now does this mean that the actual light that he's taking a picture of is shaped like a tree or a heart or a star? No. Everything looks like a star because you're looking through a star that you covered your lens with. And... and Perhaps that's what all this is. Maybe all of these amazing God moments, whether they were a, uh, in a deep mystical experience or whether they were synchronicities or they were just dreams or thoughts even. If I have on a metaphoric God-shaped filter over my metaphoric lens, everything is going to look like God, even if it is not God. And so let's imagine uh, this scenario, okay, to be the true reality. And again, the assumption here for this thought experiment is that God is not real. All he is is a, a metaphoric equivalent of a filter that I subconsciously put on my lens. And so with that understanding, let's now look back on that infamous trip, okay, trip number 15, all of those amazing synchronicities and stuff that happened. And now that we're aware of this illusory, misleading God filter on our lens, let's remove that filter, okay? So once we remove it, what do we have here? And so, but before I even start with any of these examples, we need to kind of do away and dispense with uh, one of the easiest kind of low-hanging fruit, knee-jerk reaction, wave hand kind of explanations that a, a rationalist would offer, right? And that is that everything can be written off here because it's all just hallucinations, all right? We can't lean on that argument because any mystic can come along and say, no, we can't write it all off. There is an underlying pattern that needs to be explained. And so, we need to dive into that pattern and explain that pattern. And that's kind of what we're going to do here. So let's start with the trip as a whole. Okay. Very simple explanation to the pattern of the trip as a whole. And, and that is this, okay. Finding out answers about the failed ultrasound that I got, you know, that happened. Okay. That was the overwhelmingly most critical, important thing in my life that day. So it makes perfect sense to me, okay, that any hallucinations that I have on a mind-altering substance would f follow that theme and that pattern, okay? I wanted input on my daughter, and my subconscious provided said input, okay? It, it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, this is like an open and shut case. But let's don't shut the case quite yet, because we got to iron out some of these other details, like... Specifically, you know, why would I see the Archangel Gabriel and Jesus back to back? Well, for the two months before that experience, okay, I had been reading this book, okay, The Diary of St. Gemma, a diary by a girl that lived in the early 1900s who claimed to have almost daily visions of her guardian angel and Jesus. 
And these visions were extreme and they were intense and they were very psychedelic like, at least that's kind of how I pictured them in my mind's eye when I was reading. And so with that in mind, is it all that surprising that I would have similar visions on a deep psychedelic trip? No, not at all. My interaction on this trip was, uh, granted, a, a tad more personal, of course, but the overall pattern was almost spot on with St. Gemma's Diary, okay? A, a guardian angel always, like, showed up and chewed her out for sinning and eventually kind of walks it back and consoles her and tells her that it's all going to work out okay if she obeys, right? Then Jesus shows up and he's all crucified and he, he dives deeper into the whole obedience thing. He shares a lot of love and wisdom and assigns a few tasks before piecing out. That is the exact pattern. And even when we're talking about the specific details of Jesus on, on that trip, you know, like with the whole crying thing, you know, where the whole house was crying, the windows and the walls and stuff. And then I see Jesus and he told me that he cried all the time and that he cried equally for all the pain that he saw in the world and all of the beauty. And there was that just amazing moment, right? Super amazing, super cool. Until you consider... That a few days before the trip, I saw a YouTube video about something called the Letter of Lentulus. I, I don't know if it's Lin, Lentulus or Lentulus. We're going to call it Lentulus. A letter written to the Roman Senate, okay, allegedly written during Jesus' life, describing him and his personality in great detail. And it specifically mentions, y'all, specifically mentions that he was constantly weeping. And that, of course, was the most emotionally impactful part of that letter for me. And so again, on a psychedelic experience, when my mind is patterning and my subconscious is filling in details, it makes sense that one of the details that it fills in is the thing that resonated the most with me in that letter. Okay, Jesus crying. And it doesn't help at all here that the letter of Lentulus uh, to begin with is regarded by most scholars to be a freaking hoax. And so we, we have here a, a triple whammy of, of fakeness here for crying out loud, literally. But so far, all, all of these things are outside sources that are influencing my experience. But there, there was one thing, y'all, that was straight up me, like my own self tricking myself. If, if you recall the part with the shoes, like the, you know, the, I don't know, uh, disciple sandals. Okay. That I claim magically appeared directly in my path. When I reentered the room, that miracle that I thought Jesus created there, you know, and I was like, um, you know, I don't remember seeing these earlier. How did these get here? I didn't wear these shoes today. Right. Remember that? Well, when I showed my wife this and explained it to her, not only was she like, well, no, those actually were already there, but she went on to tell me that I apparently leave shoes there all the time without thinking. And it makes total sense to me, y'all, because I am a very absent-minded person. It, not only could, w could I have left them there without thinking, but I also could have sat down right next to them without even seeing them, you know, before they quote unquote magically appeared there. And so n none of this, like none of it at all, <laughs> was what I originally thought it was, especially when you factor in th this predictive element, okay, the, the, the angel th telling me straight up that there was going to be a, a miracle that was going to happen. This is a prediction, y'all, and that prediction flat out didn't come true. But the thing is, y'all, there is an elephant in the room with us right now. And whether you know it or not, you are closing your eyes and plugging your ears right now and going la 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 trying to pretend it does not exist, but it does exist y'all and we need to talk about it. What I'm about to say, I, I hope people don't take as me calling anyone stupid or me saying that I am smarter than anyone else or whatever. Plenty of other people have gone through this same kind of thing, okay? But my mystical renaissance that I've experienced in the past four years, okay, that this psychedelic induced mystical renaissance, it has caused my mind to blossom in such ways that I never could have previously even conceived. The levels of abstractness that my brain has stretched to trying to figure out all of this hyper cosmic stuff, y'all, whether it's true or not, whether God is true or not, whether 
the magic of synchronicity is true or not. I owe it to my intellect that I've expanded in the past four years. I owe it to that intellect to close the loop here, because even if you think it is closed and, and I don't blame you because my old rationalist self would think the same thing, it's not closed. If we are being intellectually honest with ourselves, y'all, we have to consider other things. In fact, we got to consider one really big thing that completely torpedoes all of that rationalist logic that I just threw out there, y'all, and that is the concept of predestination. Now, I know that's a very uh, dividing concept, and you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't believe in predestination or something as preposterous as like God's plan or whatever. But again, I have to consider all possibilities here if I'm being intellectually thorough. And so looking back again at Trip 15, uh, the diary of St. Gemma, the letter of Lentulus, these primers that a rationalist would say influenced my trip, you know, like you know, my subconscious drawing upon recent and impactful events. No God here, right? Well, what if this was all planned? If it was part of God's plan, okay, for me to happen upon the diary of St. Gemma and the letter of Lentulus, regardless of its authenticity, if it was part of God's plan for me to be absent-minded and leave my shoes in the perfect spot, regardless if I had done it multiple times before, y'all, it, it all it takes is one time for it to truly matter. I mean, w which scenario would be more magical here, okay? Uh, either God teleporting those shoes to the right place or the, at the right time for this message of discipleship to be delivered? I mean, no doubt that's magic, right? But something that I would consider even more magical, like exponentially more so, would be if God controlled every single subatomic particle and force in the universe and set these dominoes in motion since the beginning of time, and one subgroup of these dominoes is me being absent-minded and putting my shoes in that exact spot, you know, repeatedly. And even after years of doing this, I was always meant to put those shoes there for this reason. Everything in the universe that ever was conspiring and triangulating in the moment for a particular moment of predestination. That is a whole other level of magic, y'all, that is infinite. You show me a magic trick where you can teleport some shoes and I'm going to be like, oh, wow. You show me a magic trick where you control every single freaking subatomic particle and force in the universe to have it all triangulate for a beautiful synchronistic moment. And then simultaneously with everything else going on in the universe, all other subatomic particles and forces are being triangulated in other synchronistic moments. And there's these huge roll-up effects of uh, synchronicities within synchronicities and so on and so forth, y'all. This We are talking about the only way you could pull this off is with a giant freaking supercomputer that... It, it, you might be able to do it with quantum computing or something like that, y'all, but it, it's like that is a freaking magic trick. And if there is a god, and if he is infinitely powerful, he could do this. In fact, it, it would be easy for him to do this. And not only that, he could also do this in such a way that there's a poetic sense of plausible deniability. And I'm not saying, you know, what I'm, what I'm about to say here, I'm not saying is the absolute truth, okay? I'm trying to be objective and present all sides, specifically for someone who thinks that they have their mind made up. I'm just offering up different things that you may not have thought of, okay? But let's say for a second, uh, let's do a little hypothetical, and let's say here that I am God, and I want people to figure things out for themselves. I don't want to overtly make myself known because I value the beauty and catharsis of faith over just straight up knowledge. Regardless if you think that's cool or not, let's just imagine that concept being my going in position here, okay? The riddle of faith which ultimately means belief in something, even with the lack of proof, this always must be maintained and preserved and protected. And so if that is the goal, then it would be best to orchestrate all of these otherwise magical acts of synchronicity through the medium of nature, through the medium of science or rationalism or materialism, whichever one you want or 
all. If I am God and I don't want to be overtly known, this is a perfect way to transmute or, or and or to launder my involvement in this whole thing, my touch, my signature within this synchronistic system. Nature and science and rationalism and materialism, they become here convenient and poetic tools like uh, puppets or, or, or even scapegoats for me, God, okay, to wink at you without winking at you. It would not only be a perfect system, it would also be a transcendent system and one that would e effectively bait you through mystery and intrigue into wanting to know more, to dive deeper, and to establish uh, basically a deeper relationship with the otherwise unreachable. And not to mention that this system also has a built-in um, testing mechanism, okay, that, you know, because everything can be explained away rationally, you have to dive deeper into yourself and deeper into your relationship with the unreachable, and it all tests your mettle and your resolve and your dedication. It's a faith-building and buttressing machine. And I know that the purpose of this episode was to scrutinize this stuff and be objective here. But that concept that I just explained is kind of the ultimate trump card. It's like, even if you can prove to me that synchronicity is 100% just coincidence, like nothing magical, and you, you think you have me backed in the corner with my back to the ropes here, I could just come over the top with my overhand right and say, of course it is. Here in this physical existence, it will always look like coincidence, but in a higher reality, God is actually engaging physical existence to carry out his will. Boom. I have just transcended rationalism and materialism right there. The problem, of course, is that this may seem like a trump card to some, but to others, in fact, probably quite a bit of others, uh, even myself included a little bit here, this sounds more like a giant cop-out. But here's the thing. Science could still potentially figure all of this stuff out. If you want to trace science to God, go check out something called the Amplitohedron. Okay, I'm going to leave links to it in this description on uh, YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. If I was God, the Amplitohedron would be the exact tool that I would use to carry out all of my synchronicities. That would be the interface. Now, could science ever breach and, and go beyond that interface to find God? I, I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? All I'm saying is... Show me the person who wrote the rule that science and God can never blend and, you know, are mutually exclusive, and I will show you someone with a closed mind. Now, with all that being said, okay, it, it may seem to some of you that I just intellectually goon-handed all the rationalists out here with this whole predestination thing, but before all of you pro-magic, pro-God, synchronicity apologists, you know, get too comfortable here... Let me just remind you of that stupid freaking witch on a broom synchronicity, all right? If everything I said is actually real and predestination is a real thing, that means that God set every subatomic particle and force in the universe in motion since the Big Bang, okay, 13.7 billion years of dominoes falling, just to show me a freaking witch and a freaking broom. And, you know, it, it would be one thing if there was some kind of undercurrent in my life dealing with witches or brooms or, or something like that that it was referencing here or something happens later uh, after this experience with a witch or a broom or the show Wicked or something that ties all of this back together. If that happened, uh, I would be like, oh, wow, witches and brooms. It all makes sense. But there was nothing like that, y'all. Nothing at all. It was just a one and done thing. And so why would God do this? If God was at the helm of this one, it seems like a freaking awful waste of time and energy and resources and, and, and everything, y'all. It, it would be flat out stupid. But then on the other hand, you have that amazing heaven synchronicity. And that one is the furthest thing from stupid that I could possibly imagine. But then you have the ultrasound heartbeat miscarriage catastrophe, and this all falls apart again. 
And I was fully prepared to throw the baby out with the bathwater, y'all. But in the wake of that catastrophe, for me, a lot of things happened. First and foremost, uh, you know, I had a mental breakdown, okay? As I mentioned, I, 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 it was God who promised me all of this stuff, and then it didn't happen. And so I, I not only called signs and synchronicities into question, but also everything that I had experienced in the past four years of my life, including God himself, it was all looking more and more like, and I know I keep saying this, but a, a live action version of a Rorschach inkblot test. I, all of these supposed synchronicities, no matter how magical, that uh, they are just neutral stimuli onto which I project my hopes and wishes and fears and wonders and all that stuff. And then, of course, if you try to take one of these Rorschach interpretations and apply it to real life, when, when these projections were finally put to the test and had to make their leap out of fantasy land into real life... They unsurprisingly failed because they were figments of my freaking imagination. And so in the wake of that uh, perceived betrayal, that what I just explained there sounded like an intellectually complete answer to me at the time, albeit a heartbreaking one, but it was complete or uh, complete enough for my satisfaction at least. But then, lo and behold, something happened to me just two days after my rejection of synchronicity that brought me back almost completely. You know, uh, I, I still kind of kept it at arm's length, mind you, because I'm still kind of skeptical, but th this amazing thing happened. Uh, basically, someone I love uh, a, a lot, okay, who shares in my struggle quite a bit. I'm not going to mention who it is out of respect, but someone who means the freaking world to me knew that I was devastated and asked me to join him for lunch and right out of the gate. I got a triple number synchronicity. And y'all, I was in no mood to tolerate any kind of nonsense about freaking numbers. But lo and behold, y'all, we go to this lunch spot where they go off of a number system. Like you, you say, oh, I'll have a number uh, 13 or something. So I got a number 52. And then the, that person that I'm with that I love a lot, he was going to get something completely different, but then changed his mind to a number 52 also. And so I'm like, okay, well, two 52s in a row, that's not that big of a deal. But then we got our order number. Okay. So like all those numbers that we just ordered, like two 52s. And then the guy's like, okay, here's your ticket. And your number is guess what? 50 freaking two. Right. So that's three 52s in a row. And I'm like, okay, that piques my interest. Still skeptical, but piques my interest. So we sit down and we start to eat, and he starts talking to me about forgiveness, which of course was one of the central themes of Trip 15, which happened just two days prior. And then he folds the concept of forgiveness into talking about the 12-step program and starts talking about the specific step in the 12-step program that the character named Andrew was talking about with his mother in the scene in the show Desperate Housewives that my wife was watching during my trip two days prior. If you recall during that trip, I heard my name from the other room and I peeked my head around the corner thinking, you know, this is a sign that I need to follow. I opened the door and there's an addict named Andrew talking about 30 days of sobriety, the exact same goal I was trying to hit, y'all. Anyway, him and his mom were talking about the 12-step program and were focusing on one step in the program. And the same step that my loved one is sitting across the table talking to me about right now in this moment. But that's not the end of it, y'all. Then, unprompted, the person I'm eating lunch with starts talking about something profound that they realized about Jesus and then starts crying. And because he is crying, I understand that I had better pay close attention to what he is saying because he finds it important enough to cry over. And again, two days after having a mystical experience with Jesus about crying and listening. Fast forward a couple more days and I'm on a road trip with my wife and I'm listening to a podcast. And when that episode I chose was over, the podcast app randomly selected an episode from a channel I had never heard of before, a channel called Unexplainable. But it's not the name of the channel that piqued my interest. It was the name of the episode. Just a few days after having a deep mystical experience with Jesus about crying, my podcast app randomly selected an episode called Why We Cry. 
an episode that dives into the science, the psychology, the sociology of why humans cry and how crying opens us up to a deeper state of being. And I was sufficiently blown away, not only by the serendipity of the concept of crying coming up once again in a random way, but I was even more blown away by the content of the episode. It was a blueprint on how through crying, we connect deeper with people and not just deeper, the deepest of deep, the truest and most pure baseline for emotional communication. It was almost as if I could close my eyes and hear Christ speaking his manifesto. And don't worry, in the next episode of this podcast, we are going to dive deep into what was said and how it pertains to every freaking human being on the planet. But for now, we are going to dive deep into what happened next, because I am not done. When that episode was over, the very next episode again, chosen at random by the podcast app, was an episode called Are You Listening? An episode on a different channel that dives deep into the science, the psychology, and the sociology of listening, and how by listening better and deeper, we open ourselves up to a deeper state of being, one in which we connect deeper and empathize deeper. Again, I am hearing the words of Christ an expansion, a continuation of what he told me on my trip. And once again, I am left wondering, is this pure coincidence? Or is there an infinite force out there that can manipulate reality, bending and using the free will of the multitudes to triangulate this moment in time? For me, all the while triangulating different but overlapping moments in time for everyone else involved. It is either the simplistic mindlessness of coincidence, randomness, chaos, or it is an infinitely complex and ever-evolving organism. If we are trying to figure out all possible possibilities here, it can either be one or the other, and it is impossible for it to be neither. But what's going to cause you to rip your hair out and keep you up at night is the possibility that it could be both. All right. What you're about to hear is a bit of an offshoot. So far, this uh, episode has had a degree of polish. You know, I've had some sound effects and music or whatnot. I just had a little music segment there. And I'm talking on this awesome, crisp and clear Neumann microphone right now. But uh, I've I've reached a fork in the road on this podcast episode where uh, things get extremely complicated from here on out. And so complicated that it's the equivalent of listening to someone like a, like a college professor just give a boring lecture, right? And so I, I d- dug deep and, and had some actual synchronicities that hit me that, that basically told me that I need to get to some emotional pay dirt and resonate with folks. And so I decided, you know, the best way to do that usually for me is, is if I strip everything bare, I don't speak on this uh, crisp and clear Neumann microphone, and I instead get on my phone and just start talking casually and, you know, calmly into my voice memo. But as you're about to hear, things go from calm to very emotional very quick. But I wanted to kind of let you know before we jump into the deep end here of what's about to happen. Things are about to get very real, very fast. And it's going to be a bit of a crash course from here on out. But I promise you it's pertinent and a beautiful story. So here we go. Okay, y'all. <clears throat> I prayed to God last night, or actually this morning. It was four thirty a.m. ish, and I asked God to use me as a mouthpiece to deliver the message that I was intending to deliver in this podcast episode to begin with. I have been getting this. Episode is about synchronicity, y'all. Straight up. And it's it should be of no surprise to you that I'm back on the wagon when it comes to synchronicity. And that's because 
of the God element here is inescapable and it's interwoven so deeply in synchronicity that it, even these ones that don't pan out, like the promise of the miracle of my baby daughter being born and then she's not, even if that wasn't a misinterpreted synchronicity or and or a flat out lie by a uh, potential uh, being of cosmic <laughs> stature. And I'm trying to think of the words. I mean, th- th- that could have been the enemy, y'all, knowing full well that my daughter wasn't going to make it. It doesn't take a genius to kn- to know that the particular kind of IVF route that we went, and I'm not going to mention what it is because it's going to give away too much information, and that's pr- personal and private information, but we went a particular route where right off the bat, you're at a detriment. Right off the bat, you're at a disadvantage. Right off the bat, your numbers are lower in terms of making it to a full-term pregnancy, but not even a full-term pregnancy, to achieving that initial heartbeat This was unknown to me and my wife. If it was told to us, we didn't pay attention. And we and should we have done our research deeper and found out the the particular thing about like when you go down this particular avenue, your percentage points drop to this. Yes, we should have, but we were riding a wave of tension and drama and money. And stress and all this other stuff, y'all, and with all this stuff going on, that that knowledge slipped past us somehow. And so it honestly doesn't take a genius to know that the likelihood that we would have a heartbeat was low to begin with. And so... This thing, this being of cosmic stature, as I so like uneloquently put it, this thing didn't even need to have cosmic knowledge. It didn't need to have like a future, um, you know, uh, purview into the future. He doesn't even need to have a infinite or near infinite knowledge of the present. All he needs to know is that the percentage, the likelihood of our baby daughter developing a heartbeat, reaching that point of of the embryonic development was going to be significantly lower. And so if you were the enemy trying to screw with me, trying to get me to turn away from God, trying to get me to rebel against God, which I did, this thing was successful, I would use that knowledge against me. So that thing didn't even need, I'm, I'm, and and let's not forget the the, the fact, and and I say this is a fact, y'all, because this is what I observed, okay? Whether this was quote unquote real or not, that's a different story. I am reporting to you what I saw. Now, was what I saw a figment of my imagination constructed by my subconscious? Maybe. But I'm going to make a point in a little bit that even that doesn't matter. Even if it was just my imagination coming up with this stuff, it doesn't matter. But we're going to go back to that. Bookmark that thought for a second. We're going to go back to that. I saw, whether it was real or not, I'm reporting to you and I'm not lying what I saw, about what I saw. I saw Jesus Christ, three versions of him, one crucified in my door. The second version was a, a, refractive, a refraction of, of a projected face that was larger in uh, looking at you. It was like, a, I don't know how to explain it other than that. It was like this... Once you looked at a certain angle, it's like his face popped out and became magnified. And that was like the second version of him. And then there was a third version of him that I didn't see until a little, a little bit later when he brought up the concept of forgiveness and listening. He was holding down, y'all. He was physically restraining 
a being of cosmic stature. What I saw, I cannot describe. I can describe Jesus perfectly. That he was just how he looks in his uh, in his uh, tunic and, and everything, and uh, holding holding it down. And whether that is an anglicized, westernized um, portrayal of Jesus, again, I don't care. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain uh, why later. Even if this was a figment of my imagination, I don't care. And I'm going to explain why later. But regardless, Jesus was holding down a being a cosmic spiritual being very much like what I saw earlier that was yelling at me and chastising me and lambasting me and throwing out false promises. False promises that it likely knew were already impossible. Or maybe it didn't know, but it was wedging, it was hedging its bets. And it, it's almost a win-win for it, Right. If it di- if it does happen now I tr- and if it does happen and, and the baby does develop a heartbeat, well now I trust that thing more and I'll listen to it the next time it tries to talk to me and do what it says. But if it is su- but if it if it succeeds, like in other words, if it if its prediction doesn't come if it, if it's fa- if its lie comes true. Right, that's a pretty interesting concept—a lie coming true. But if its lie happened, and of which it did, if it if its lie happens and the baby does not develop a heartbeat, well, now I'm pissed off at God, and now I reject God, and now I dump, uh, I do, I dive back down into the dark, um, you know, nihilistic hole from whence I came. And I'm back to the old me doing the old stuff and um, wrecking, wrecking lives, my own and others. Uh, so much so that it, it would, it, like its goal would be to wreck my life so bad that I kill myself or wreck someone else's life so bad through me that they kill themselves. Or best, situ- best kind of situation is we all kill each other and as many as people as possible. It's an ensuer of chaos. It's an ensuer of lies. All I'm saying is I saw Jesus Christ holding down something that looked very much like what I saw. The thing, the being that was yelling at me. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind, right? So just, again, keep that in mind. But the reason why, y'all, I can't pretend like I'm impartial anymore. The reason why I can't go into this equal on both sides is because I can't separate God from synchronicity, no matter how how hard I try. The aftermath of what happened was so incredibly, jaw-droppingly beautiful that Anyone would be able to find God in what happened after all of this. There was a series of synchronicities, y'all, that I've already mentioned, the one with, with the, uh, the, my, the, the person that I love dearly. We're talking about the 12-step program and the, uh, you know, number 52 uh, repeated three times. And then he starts crying about his um, the re- realization about Jesus, which triggers me to listen. So we got... We got number synchronicity, which is the lesser of that. We have a callback to the um, the twelve step program synchronicity with the desperate housewives and the addict on that show named Andrew. All that stuff. We have a hearkening back to um, the concept of listening, which is a big, uh, or the concept of forgiveness first, which was a huge part of the trip. Uh, listening, which is a huge part of the trip, uh, and crying, which is a huge part of the trip. Then the then the podcast episodes that randomly popped out, the science of behind why we cry and how it uh, deepens us in our relationships with others, and the science of listening and how it deepens us in our relationships with others. And it sounds exactly like the words of Jesus Christ just going through the podcast, through the speakers, going straight into my ears. And it, I all but cried my eyeballs out. And then a, a, another part of that trip was about suffering. And I, I haven't mentioned this one in the podcast yet, but uh, on our way back from that road trip, 
my my wife is going through her Instagram and there is a person that she knows who is um, without trying to give too much away here. She is famous within Texas. She is a a Texas celebrity, and she was uh, on a, on a thing. I'm not going to say what that thing is, but the MC of this thing asked her to 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 describe her blessings in life. And she said that hers, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my entire life. And she said, my struggles are my blessings. And this woman just, first of all, she's 20, uh, at the time, 25 years old. A 25-year-old, gorgeous woman, by the way, like ridiculously gorgeous. Um, so she lost her, like, like she, she, this kind of wisdom should not be coming out of the mouth of a 25-year-old gorgeous woman. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to say that gorgeous women are, are incapable of this, but the sage-like wisdom coming out of this woman who just lost her mother to ALS, who was another gorgeous woman, who just a year and a half before this was walking and talking like a normal person. And then you fast forward a few months and this the, the woman is having to wheel her mom around quadriplegic, and then she dies. Devastating to see a strong, powerful, beautiful woman like that be crippled and dead within a year and a half. Absolutely devastating. This unbelievable person looked the MC in the face and said, my struggles are my blessing. I can turn my struggles around to help people. And that's why I consider them a blessing. And it causes me to empathize deeper with others. And she rattled on about uh, three or four other things. And I almost pulled off the road and started sobbing like I'm kind of doing right now. It was so freaking beautiful. (coughs) And the lead up, y'all. The lead up to the trip was struggling. The the Diary of St. Gemma was nothing but... How to alchemize suffering. And Jesus would visit this poor girl who would who suffered terribly every day. She had some medical condition. I forget exactly what. But then in her visions with Jesus, it was pain, pain, pain. Jesus was crucified on the cross and bleeding. And he would take his crown of thorns on and off his head and jam it onto her head and it would hurt. And sometimes he would leave the crown of thorns on as he, you know, pieced out. He would leave that crown of thorns on her head. You know, again, it's a figurative, like, and it wasn't literally happening, but in her head it was. And it was incredibly painful. And she got to the point where the suffering became a, and this is a very Catholic thing, okay? So I apologize ahead of time for you non Catholics out there or you're not, or you non believers in general. But this pain started to transform into a, suffering for for something that you love and suffering for something that is worth suffering for and that you care about and is wholesome and everything right in this world. And she alchemized her pain and her suffering into suffering for Jesus, suffering for love, suffering for others, sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was my lead in to the trip, y'all, is like this poor girl visited by her guardian angel and visited by Jesus Christ every day. And, and lo and behold, I get visited by my guardian angel and Jesus Christ on that trip. Coincidence? And then, y'all, you factor in that... One of my, I'm going to call you a dear friend, sir. I think you're an awesome person and you, you are going to realize that one day. And I hope you do soon because you're freaking awesome, man. This guy that I'm trying to help who I've, who I've come to know through this podcast, he's really struggling. And I understand, I understand the struggle, man, big time. And I'm trying to help, trying to get answers for you. The day before, y'all, this trip, he messaged me and he said, Hey, he didn't know I was reading the the diary of Saint Gemma, by the way. Uh, he mentioned randomly, he said, Hey, you should try reaching out to see if you can get assistance from your guardian angel. 
And I, I don't really believe in guardian angels. I kind of do now, maybe, I guess. But back th- at that point, I did not. And, and, but I was going in for my daily 4.30 a.m. prayer. And I was like, you know what? I, I need all the help I can get. Screw it. I'm going to ask for my guardian angel. And so I did. And lo and behold, my guardian angel shows up. Again, coincidence or God, right? What's really going to freak you out, y'all, is what the name of that guardian angel is. So, you know, mine came out and I heard the word, like, quote, unquote, my guardian angel showed up. And I still have doubts on what that thing was. But I heard the name Gabriel clear as day from the room away from me in the uh, show Def- Desperate Housewives. Now, it could have been Gabrielle because that's the name of one of the main characters. But regardless, right when I was like trying to figure out what that thing was, I hear the name Gabriel or Gabrielle. Now, so that that freaking archangel or whatever uh, would be my, uh, you know, uh, our, uh, you know, guardian angel sent down or whatever. I don't know. But this person who I met through the podcast who has said I should seek help from my guardian angel, y'all, he's been visited by his apparently in, in dreams and stuff like that a lot frequently. Guess, take one wild guess what the name of his guardian angel is. And, and, and I, will, I will preface it, and this is going to give it away. I will preface this by saying he, di- he did not know the name of my unborn daughter at this point. He did not know the name. The name of his guardian angel, drum roll please, Julia. Yeah, y'all, Julia. And if you don't know, that's the name of my daughter. Added components to this story is both he and I started having identical kind of things happen to us to where our stories and our our paths and our journey started overlapping significantly, where we are afraid and terrified of the exact same thing. I, I was sick. I had some kind of respiratory infection that lasted a solid six and a half or seven months straight. I thought at one point I was dying. And you know what exacerbated that fear was I went in on a psychedelic experience and I heard a download straight from uh, the nether world, whatever you want to call it, from the spirit world, whatever you want to call it, I got a download that, Andrew, you have cancer and you're dying. This respiratory infection is actually lung cancer. Lung ca- cancer runs in your family, right? Sure, you're not a smoke- smoker, but anyone can get lung cancer. Uh, you know, uh, you can get lung lung cancer without smoking. And so I was, I was like, I have cancer. Meanwhile, this guy also is getting dreams and visions that he has cancer. And we both almost approach each other at the same time saying, I'm dying. And and I'm like, what? You too? You're getting these these signs and signals too that you have cancer? He's like, yeah. I'm like, same here, dude. Like, what the heck's that all about? Come to find out neither of us have cancer, which again, um, harkens back to this whole questioning the the you know the messages from the other side and should we trust signs and synchronicities at all or are they just mere projections of your own hopes and fears and wishes and all this stuff in this case it would be a projection of my fear you have a a a, a neutral stimulus presented to you and your brain meets it more than halfway and projects onto that neutral stimulus uh, the fear of i'm dying and it makes it so and you treat it as real. And that's where we get into this bifurcation of synchronicities, because for sure there are examples of that. For sure there are places where your mind reaches and papers over and, and patterns over with, with meaning drawn from your own, again, hopes, wishes, fears, and, and, uh, and, and all that. It becomes a wish fulfillment uh, kind of, kind of uh, environment. For sure... There's a subcategory, a bifurcation of synchronicities that are that. How do I know? Because I don't have cancer. How do I know? Because my baby daughter did not develop a heartbeat. How do I know? Because the person who died on mile marker 666, where that crucifix is, was not the person who I thought it was. It was a different person. And so that deep synchronicity with the guy, with the lady's husband, whose name is Andrew, and then the pastor says, 
We Love You Infinity, which was the central theme of my ayahuasca experience that I had just a day before that. All of that means really nothing if it's the wrong person, y'all. But the whole point of this and the whole reason why I can't take my left foot, it's like my right foot's out the door, my left foot's still in the threshold here. I cannot take my left foot over that threshold because the follow-up to that synchronicity that went amok, that got torpedoed by the, the wrong person being dead, which is a silly thing. So it's like, man, I really, I really hoped it was the right person who died. I'm playing around with people's lives here and that's not cool at all. But the end of that story, y'all, was God. Right when I was at the lowest of lows thinking my, that my, my cherished proof of God is gone that, that synchronicity with the guy named Andrew and we love you infinity and all this stuff, there was such a perfect little uh, bow, a ribbon just tied up in a beautiful knot of there's my proof right there. E even if that can be explained away rationally, there's so many overlapping synchronicities going on here that it's, anyone should be scratching their head and being like, wow, that is actually pretty interesting. I need to think deeper on this matter. But no, it got torpedoed. And I was broken by that. And I started questioning, I'm such a weak person in my faith at this point. I'm a toddler. I'm an, uh, I, no, I wasn't even a toddler. I was like a one-year-old at this point in my faith. So I'm very fragile. And so that was a deep blow. And I'm sulking and I'm angry and I'm on the verge of go, like going home. I was at my friend's ranch. And I saw a light. I know I'm rehashing this story. I saw a light off in the distance that looked exactly like the light on my porch at my hometown, or you know, at my boyhood where I grew up, my home in Manville, Texas. My first moment with God. This light looked exactly like that, but way far off, way further off, and way off in the void in the darkness. Just one solitary light. And it hit me. God is still God. And even if my proof falls apart, it is faith that matters, not proof. Proof is knowledge, and knowledge is not part of this equation. The beauty uh, and catharsis of faith is the end all be all. You cannot achieve that if you just know. And so facts and knowledge our second fiddle, not even second fiddle, they are 11 de billionth fiddle to faith. Next day, there's this large, this loud com uh, commotion. You hear a, 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 a horse going, <laughs> you hear a bunch of kids screaming. I round the corner, there's a horse with its hoof stuck in a cattle guard and it, and it rips itself free and, and rips off a big, a big chunks of flesh from its hoof as, as it does so. I'm thinking the worst. I'm like, this poor horse is going to get put down. We've all heard about these, um, these terrible incidents that happen at racetracks where a horse simply twists its ankle and they have to go out and put it down. And I'm like, this horse is going to die. And I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can to console and comfort this horse and speak just sweet things into its ear before something terrible like that happens. I'm going to make sure that this thing gets sent off with peace and love and beauty. And I'm walking up to that horse and my friend uh, whose family's ranch it is, comes walking up also. And I said, hey, what's the horse's name? And he looks up to me and says, her name is Faith. Faith. I can't tell y'all how impactful a moment like that is. If you have your foot out the door, you take your foot right back in instantly in a moment like that. And that's what I'm telling you happened in the wake of the worst failure of synchronicity that I could possibly imagine. 
my baby daughter not making it. Come to find out, I just misinterpreted the signs. I had an experience a couple days ago, y'all, in which Jesus Christ himself told me, Andrew, Julia, and this is going to sound harsh, but he said it in a way that was so beautiful, y'all. You had to have been there in the mind melds to understand why this is beautiful and not sad. In this mind meld with me, he said, Andrew, I'm sorry to tell you this. Julia was never yours. She was always mine, and I needed her, and I took her, and she is with me now. And I'm happy with that. That is awesome. There's more to that story, by the way. I'm not going to tell you that. That's going to be in a future episode. Just wait. Just freaking wait on that one, y'all. But I want to finish the rest of this story here. All this stuff about suffering, y'all. Let me tell you about suffering. And let me tell you about getting rescued from suffering. When you lose God himself, when all of your, everything that rescued you from the gutter and death is built on synchronicity and and signs and wonders, because you're a scientifically minded person and you need proof, there's no other way it could have happened for me. And then I get this proof and then it blows up in my face and God is now dead to me. Y'all, when I left that devastating scenario of, hey, that's the third ultrasound, buddy. There is no other one. There is no more ultrasounds. Your child, they didn't say these words, but they might as well have. Your child is dead. Get over it. I had to go to work immediately after this. I work with children, y'all. Or I worked with children. I, I, I quit that job. Uh, this is a long story. But I, I, was a, I, I taught film to uh, elementary school kids, filmmaking. I know that sounds like an impossible task, and it was. But let me, let me finish this story. I've lost everything. On my drive back... On my drive to school, I am losing it, y'all. I get to work. I I walk into my classroom. I'm prepping. I had missed the first uh, class. Uh, I have my second class, which is third graders, the youngest ones that I teach. And I am coiled, y'all, and ready to explode at the first child who says something rude or inappropriate or is simply talking while I'm talking and being disruptive. The first child who does this, I like no joke in my head, y'all, I was going to grab a chair and throw it through a window, and then I was going to march into the principal's office and quit on the spot. That's how bad this was. This is how devastated I was. And this is what happened. I get a little knock on the door. I open the door. And there's the teacher dropping off the kids. I see a kid right in front of me. And her name, of all things, y'all, is Genesis. The very first thing that happens is she runs up and gives me a hug. And not just a little pat on the back hug. She embraces me and wraps herself around me hug. And that prompts every one of those little children. Something like 15 of them to come in and give me a giant hug. And I'm surrounded by all these children hugging me and it saved me. Genesis, that darling little girl who... I I can't, I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but Genesis is by far my favorite. Not by far, y'all. There's so many, if any of the, if any of my other students hear this, I loved you all dearly. There's a reason I cried on my last day, y'all. 
I love you so much. I'm, and I miss you so much that I miss missing you. I haven't seen you in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, long, in a long time. And absence and time dilutes your longingness for people. And so when I say that I miss missing you, I love y'all so much that I wish I could feel the same pain that I felt. I miss missing you. Anyway, Genesis saved my life that day, y'all. A girl named Genesis saved my life that day. The integration that happened thereafter it spun my world around in ways that you cannot imagine. Suddenly everything started making sense, specifically around suffering. I started thinking about, you know, after after hearing, you know, this was later, this wasn't on that very day. That that very day with the kids hugging me, that just opened up my mind to a light at the end of the tunnel. And suddenly I'm I'm thinking about things differently, not in a vengeful manner, not a scorched earth manner, not in a burn God's creation to the ground and spit on it manner, which which was my mindset until those those children hugged me. Uh, suddenly I'm I'm looking at things more acceptingly and intellectually. And I approach this concept of suffering again. I reapproach it. And it suddenly makes sense to me. And this is a topic that you will hear me repeat in further episodes because I've already done several interviews after this after this incident and I've 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 said this in all, almost all of those interviews so just be ready for me to constantly repeat this uh in the coming uh months suffer I I realized that suffering is not something that you can reason with it is not a sentient being that you can sit down across the table from and say, hey, look, I know that you're a constant. I know that you are inescapable. Suffering, like you're going to be here all the time. But I'm trying to reason with you here, right? So uh, you you can come after me so long as you do not come after the things that I hold most cherished. Laughably intellectually and spiritually and courageously lazy to think that that is even remotely possible. I realized that the only way it works, y'all, is on a continuum. And you cannot have a continuum without extremes. That means that it has to go after the thing that you hold the most cherished. That's the only way it works. In fact, that's the only way you can achieve deeper catharsis and alchemization of pain and suffering is to experience the worst. It's the only way it works. It's inescapable. It's exactly what that gorgeous 25-year-old woman was saying about her mom dying of ALS. Thank God I did not have my child grow up and grow old enough and, and, and get ALS and watch her deteriorate, deteriorate, deteriorate in a year and die. Thank God. I, get, I, I will get on my hands and knees and praise God for the rest of time for that. But guess what? That woman, that 25-year-old woman gets on her hands and knees and thanks God for it happening. blows my mind. 
So when I tell you that I cannot separate God from these synchronicities, y'all, I cannot. No matter how silly some of them are. The witch on a broom, y'all. That may seem like a giant waste of resources to you, but if God is infinite, it means nothing. If God is infinitely powerful, it's not a waste of any resources or time or anything. It's just a, it's a barely any effort at all to throw a little mic check. That's what I've, I've ultimately determined. Some of these silly synchronicities are, is the equivalent of a little mic check. It's like, hey, you listening? Wasn't that cool? All right, check this out. It's either that, y'all, or I didn't understand what I was supposed to look at. Maybe there was something about witches and brooms or some kind of crap that I needed to investigate. As, as goofy as that may sound, you never know. But y'all, that's the silly witch on the broom synchronicity. Forget about it. Throw it away, okay? There is one that in my opinion, brings all of this together. Not only that, but it demonstrates holistically, in my opinion, God's infinite power and his ability to triangulate everything in the moment and uh, overtake (laughs) our free will in order to carry out predestination so convincingly that we believe it's still our free will, even though it's not, but it still is at the same time. And I'm talking, and I know how mind blowing of a concept that that is, y'all. That what I just said implies that free will and predestination are uh, uh, co- that, that they coexist, y'all, and that they don't that that there is no difference between the two. How is something like that possible? Well, y'all, all one thing that I've learned, and some, something that you had better get used to, because I'm going to be using it. Um, on, on future episodes, I'm going to be repeating this sentence. And it is a central theme uh, concept to me as of about a year ago. And I haven't caught up to, the, to this because I'm backlogged by a year on my experiences uh, in releasing episodes. But this concept has been prevalent in my experiences for about a year, maybe a year and a half. And that concept is that all paradoxes are resolved at the source. What does that mean? That means that this riddle of beauty, how imperfection needs to be within something that that should be otherwise perfect. There is no such thing as perfect symmetry. There needs the the, the true way to make something beautiful is to introduce imperfection into perfection, and that gives it a, a unique character where everything doesn't cancel itself out and it becomes more beautiful. Why, when you play a cello, does vibrato, which slightly bends a pitch up and slightly bends it down, thus making it imperfect, why does that sound more beautiful than just a regular note? This paradox, y'all, shouldn't exist, yet it does. Same thing with all of these other paradoxes like love. Why does love hurt? Why is it bondage? Why is it suffering? Why, you know... Uh, you know, uh, free will, y'all. All of these paradoxes get resolved at the source. And there is scientific precedence for this kind of thing, by the way, with relativity and quantum mechanics. There are all kinds of theories, the amplitohedron being one of these theories, which is, in my opinion, the leading contender for solving everything in the, uh, possibly comprehensible in the universe, the amplitohedron says in a higher existence, in a higher dimension, in a higher ordered reality, quantum mechanics and relativity emerge from a singular source. They are emergent properties of a singular thing that diverge in a higher reality and enter into this reality as separate and paradoxical when compared to each other. But in a higher reality, they're the same thing. That is what's going on with free will and predeterminism. I, I will bet my life on it. I know because I've seen it and I've been told about it. And I've basically been shown how it works. And how it works is 
uh, an, an example of how it works is with this synchronicity that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell y'all. If you recall the, the synchronicity where my friend sent me those, those uh, or that song, that Spanish song called uh, Ven Así a Me, which translates to come unto me in Spanish to English. It translates to come, to come unto me, which is something straight out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And my friend using his free will, not knowing that I had just had an experience with Jesus Christ and just posted a video about my experience about Jesus Christ and was just comment, uh, rep replying to a comment that someone made about Jesus Christ. And my comment was about Jesus Christ. And then my friend sends me that song, not even knowing that the song is about Jesus Christ. My friend doesn't speak Spanish. He just thought it was a cool sounding song. He knows that I liked uh, that I like um, Spanish music, mariachi and, and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, this sounds like a combination of mariachi and, and rock. I'm going to send it to, to, to Andrew. He sends it to me, not knowing that the song is basically nothing but Jesus. And the, and the, the, the mind blowing thing, y'all, the, the, the two most mind blowing things of that is that first, first and foremost, the name of the, uh, the name of the band is the Mavericks. If you recall that episode that I released I'm wa where I was watching that show about horse training on PBS and I had this amazing epiphany of how, you know, the horse trainer in this show is, is basically God and the cult that he's training is basically me or anyone else who steps up to the plate, um, you know, to, to be trained by God and 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 then you know um, there's this unbelievable correlation there but then he brings in his model horse to put the young colt at ease because this colt is freaking out and terrified because he's having to be in cl such uh, close proximity to this alien creature called a human being his horse is freaking out and in order to calm the horse down so we can be easily trained he needs to bring in a horse that speaks horse Right? A horse that says, hey, I'm one of you. Trust me, we're going with this guy. He's made me a better, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship here where I'm better off. And follow me and I will lead you to him and all will be better. That horse's name, the perfect horse that he brought in as a perfect specimen, the proxy, the proxy for Jesus, the damn horse's name was Maverick. And I kept getting synchronicities about Maverick this and Maverick that. And I would pray to God, please make me a Maverick. Please lay me down in the arena like, you, like in that show when he laid down Maverick in the arena. Please do that, God. And my friend sends me, using his own free will, that song by the Mavericks. And then there's that all those lyrics in that song, y'all. Nothing but Jesus stuff. It's like I... I, I will fight for you every day. I am here for you in your darkest hour. I am the light in the darkness, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing but lyrics about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then it comes to that, that other line. And this is the other critical thing here is it says, I will ignore you again, which is uh, what that lyric is completely out of place. And it was as if it was specifically put there for me. And it made po total sense because Jesus on my experience the day, uh, the, uh, a day and a half before that or whenever it was, Jesus, on my experience, said, if you want to talk to me, go out and talk to life. I am life. Go talk to me out there. And I went out and I tried to talk to two homeless people and they ignored me. And so, and that lit a fire under my ass to, to be better and do more so, God, so that Jesus doesn't ignore me. And so that, his ignoring me was the thing that was the most amazing part of the whole experience, the most jarring part of the whole experience. And so I knew exactly what that line meant to ignore you again, even if it was out of place. And so all of these amazingly uh, coincidental things aligning in the moment, y'all, I, of course, don't believe they're coincidental at all. I think that they're the work of an infinitely powerful God. W one that is so powerful that he can overtake all of the people's free will in that equation 
my free will and in, in trying to find him in the first place and, and to take mushrooms and talk to him. Those homeless people's free will and ignoring me. Um, my free will, again, of posting the video about this. My friend's free will about making a comment on that video about Jesus. And then me using my free will once again to reply to that comment about Jesus. And then my best friend's free will, a choice to message me about the song. But even more mind-blowing than that, y'all, the band naming themselves the Mavericks back in 1989 is when God started planning this, y'all. Started structuring and using people's free will so that everything can triangulate 35 years later. I don't know how many, I can't do arithmetic off the top of my head when I'm so inflamed in passion. It's 30 plus years later to, to, to be used to orchestrate this event in the moment. But that's not even the most mind-blowing part, y'all. Them writing the lyrics to that song back in 2012 when they were recording the album. Them writing with their own free will. They all agreed that this one line that says, to ignore you again, or whatever the, the lyric is, something about ignore, uh, ignore you again, completely lyrically out of place, thematically and lyrically out of place. It sticks out like a sore thumb in the song. I'm going to post the lyrics uh, in the description of this video. You read those lyrics and you tell me that that freaking lyric, that single line fits in. It's completely out of place. To have everyone in the band sign off on that using their own free will in 2012... 12 years later, for it to be used in such an experience through God orchestrating all of this in the moment is so utterly freaking mind-blowing, y'all. You have no idea. Maybe you're starting to get a glimpse of an idea here. And God bless you if you are, because I have been wrestling with this for four years, this unbelievable concept of such power. I have been falling backwards, having been punched in the chest, grasping at anything that I can f f grasp for on my way down. And free will and predestination were two of these things that I grasped for, y'all. And the answer that I got from God on that matter, on that particular thing, is absolutely freaking mind-blowing. If free will and predestination are the same thing, which God showed me is the case, then we all... 100% used 100% of our free will to fulfill 100% of a predestination gesture by something that is so infinitely powerful that he can so convincingly use your free will and have it still be free will, but also predestination at the same time. How does that work? I'm going to leapfrog several episodes ahead of time. I'm working on this episode right now. It's a trip that I took back in, not this past February, but the February before, where, God, where I asked God face to face, I said, how does predetermined uh, predestination and free will reconcile? Because I know that they're both, that they both are true. How does it reconcile, sir? And you know what God told me? He said, I am free will. That's how it reconciles, y'all. Our will is his will. And that is how you get predestination and free will at the same time. And I know what everyone's thinking. What about evil? Well, then, then, then that means that evil things are, no, y'all, that does not mean that. I, am, I, I have an answer for that that God showed me in a later trip. Because I thought the exact same thing you're thinking now. What's the deal with evil then? You are not going to freaking believe what he said. That is how powerful God is, y'all. And that is how mind-blowing of a mind-bending, twisting reality supersedes our reality. All paradox is resolved at the source and, you know, I was going to go off on this long, scientifically minded tangent explaining synchronicity scientifically and how, you know, scientific, in terms of physics, 
there's there, the synchronicity is a concept in physics, y'all, and all it is is a a matching of frequency. There, there's this. Uh, I'm going to try to play a video for you right now of this example. It's like you put a bunch of pendulums on a board that's moving back and forth, right? And all these pendulums are moving, are ticking, and are not pendulums, uh, metronomes. All these metronomes are clicking at the same frequency, right? And then you introduce another metronome that's ticking at a faster frequency, slightly faster, or it doesn't really even matter faster or, or how, how faster, if I remember correctly. You introduce a faster ticking metronome on that, and eventually all of those will give up energy and, uh, to, uh, to equalize, and they will all normalize into the same frequency. That's what synchronicity is uh, in, in physics. I believe that synchronicity works like spiritual synchronicity, like this stuff that Carl Jung was trying to figure out, the stuff that I'm trying to figure out in this episode, all this God stuff, y'all. I think it works the same way. I think it's no different. I think that you have a frequency that you're walking around with, and there are certain frequencies that are trying to equalize with yours. And if you are on a lower frequency, you are going to uh, synchronize with lower frequency synchronicities. And if you are on a higher frequency, you're going to synchronize with higher frequency, uh, a higher uh, frequency synchronicities. It, 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 it intellectually makes sense to me. But what, but what um, makes even more sense to me here is, you know, someone saying, well, how do you still explain the synchronicities that don't pan out. Here's how I would explain it. I think of it like fluid dynamics, right? Think of someone pouring, I don't know, water into like, I don't know, colder, like cold water into hot water. There's going to be a current of water that flows and spins off in the, in the you, know, you ever seen like the pattern of a current or whatever in, in uh, fluid dynamics, like flow kind of thing. What happens is the water in the middle kind of thing the, that, that has the most powerful kind of force behind it creates a long tail. And then the water on the edges that have less force behind it start to spin off on the edges and start to spin off into eddies. And, and they sometimes separate entirely and form their own eddies, right? Their own little tiny whirlpools. But... The, the stronger water in the middle, for lack of a better word, remains unfazed, right? It could be that that's what synchronicity is, y'all. It could be that God set the initial conditions at the dawn of time. He set, you know how I say everything is a, uh, everything is a joke, right? You could replace the word joke with paradox, right? You could replace the word paradox with yin and yang. You could, really, But I call it joke, right? So God set the initial joke from the beginning, the initial uh, synchronicity from the beginning of time. And it was the strong current, if we're, check, if, if, we're, if we're treating this like fluid dynamics, it was the strong central current, right? That central current, that extremely high frequency, is, you can, it's still achievable to meld into that. If you hit the, 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 the correct frequency, you can synchronize with that, with that frequency. But the, the synchronicity, uh, the, 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 the weaker spots on, on the edge of this flow started to spin off into chaos, right? And you either, when you, when you encounter these ones that don't pan out or are, are vindictive or whatever... They don't have that same amount of energy, that God energy in them. And some of them have splintered off from the current and formed their own eddy. Now they're detached entirely. They still have a magical component to them because overall it was still God's initial kind of breath, you know, his, his current that caused this all to happen. But some of these have spun off into their own eddies and are, and are completely detached. And if you have a low enough frequency you would resonate with those. That's what I think is ultimately going on here. Um, I'm not a thousand billion percent sold on that, 
But it makes sense to me. And once again, with everything that has happened, especially when guys, y'all, I'm gonna be, we're, I'm gonna be doing an episode about what was said in those podcasts about the importance and you know the science and the importance of crying and the the science and the importance of listening. And I want you to imagine when you hear about it because I'm gonna do an episode. Like I said, I want, I want you to imagine. That, that it's not me that's talking or or when I quote the the podcast that it's not the scientist that's talking like forget the sound of my voice or the any or the sound of anyone else's voice and I want you to for you know just flush that out of your mind and think about Jesus Christ talking to you And this was delivered to me in a synchronicity. And so this harkens back to the concept of truth. Y'all, I don't care. And this is, I told you to bookmark this concept earlier and we're bringing it back. And this is going to be another thing that you're going to hear me say multiple times in subsequent interviews and episodes after this. So pay close attention. Another thing that I've learned in this, y'all, is that truth and, and realness are not the same thing, believe it or not. If God truly does control all of the... So if the universe is an illusion, which, which it is which it has been proven to be, basically proven to be. Again, I say this in every episode, but go look up the 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics. It proves basically that the universe is an illusion. So manipulation of the universe theoretically wouldn't be too hard if it's a simulation, right? If it's an, if it's an illusion. I'm not calling it a computer simulation, y'all. So get that out of your head. But theoretically, if all of this isn't quote unquote real, it could therefore be manipulated easier and, and and is therefore it follows that it is projected from a higher reality if this isn't real then there's somewhere that is real there's somewhere that's realer than the real that we call real down here at least right if god is in control of that system and if he launders himself through that system to preserve the uh, the beauty and poetry of, of, of faith, then how do I put this? Then there is a truth that is truer than what we think of as truth, y'all. And there is a reality that is realer than what we think of as reality. But what's really going to keep you up at night, y'all, what's really going to pull your hair out Make, or make you pull your hair out is the idea, the thought of the truth. How do I put this? Something can be true and also not real. Think about that deeply. And when, I, and when you think about that, I want you to keep in mind that all forms of fiction, just about all forms of fiction, is that. The only, one of the main reasons why we love art in general, but specifically fiction, is this concept of we can dive into a situation without completely diving into it, and we can live out the potential dangers and the potential this, that, and the other, the potential, potential. But at the end of the day, what we are ultimately seeking is that archetypal axiomatic truth at the core of fiction. And so... What is fake about a fictional story that, that, that delivers an axiomatic archetypal truth? A truth that transcends any story that it's wrapped around or wrapped inside of. What, is, what are we calling fake? And when you think about that, think about reality itself. If the universe has already been proven to be an illusion, then I don't care what synchronicities are, you know, come out to be false 
or, or what synchronicities seem to be nonsense. I don't even care if you can prove to me that I did not see Jesus. It was 100% my subconscious that created a projection of Jesus, a personified embodiment of my hopes and wishes of what uh, uh, I, I needed a scapegoat to deliver this message to me. And this scapegoat that I created in my head is the likeness of Jesus. I don't care if you can prove to me that that's 100% true. I can come right back at you and say, yeah, that's exactly how God would launder himself in this situation, first of all. But even if God wasn't a part of this at all, what the figment of my imagination that I called Jesus Christ told me on that trip was realer and more true than any bit of bullshit evidence that you can wheel in front of my face with science this or fallacy that or I don't give a crap. You go wipe your butt with that stuff, y'all. I'm trying to, I, I know I just, I'm trying not to cuss. Sound like a toddler when I say words like butt, but I don't care. What is real in the face of truth? Truth supersedes and transcends realness, period. I think that's it. I think that's all I got for y'all. Sorry I had to cry a lot there, y'all. Hopefully you cried with me. That's the whole point. I love you all. We'll see you on the next episode. Pretty heavy pretty dense. I think we can all agree to that one. Do I think I made it any closer to fully understanding what synchronicity really is? Yes and no. Again, all of this can be still written off rationally and materialistically and everything like that, y'all, but the implications of if even the slightest bit of what I'm thinking is the reality, if that is the real reality in any capacity, y'all, the implications are astronomically staggering, mind-blowingly so. And so be on the lookout, y'all, for a part two of this where we dive into what actually Jesus said about crying and listening and the unbelievably, again, amazing implications of that message, that incredibly deep message. But then also get ready for, as I mentioned, an episode where I dive into the mechanics of why existence is the way it is, why evil exists in the world if, if God is actually all good and all powerful, we are going to answer that question. And it is going to blow minds like you have never <laughs> been blown before. <laughs> Uh, y'all, as far as I know, uh, it has what what has been told to me and what I have understood has never been posited by a human ever from from what I've researched. Okay, it's it's freaking epic. Okay, so I will see you soon, and uh, peace to everyone out there. And I love you. And uh, yeah, hug somebody because they may need it. You may save their life, y'all. Hug someone. Thank you. <laughs>